This is Bill Keller with the latest news on the F-102. Here, in the experimental factory at Convair, is the first of the Air Force's latest and newest weapons, the F-102 Interceptor. This airplane was designed and built in the record time of 18 months and represents the most advanced position in the state of the aeronautical art. After removal of such parts as the fin and wing tips and the nose and tail cones, the airplane is ready for shipment. After all loose parts have been removed, the airplane is given a protective paper wrapping then hoisted by crane onto a trailer truck bed where it is firmly anchored. Work at San Diego on this airplane has reached completion. The next phase of the program is to truck the airplane to Edwards Air Force Base for final installations and inspection and the start of an extensive flight test program. In the interest of security, a moderate amount of camouflage is added and the whole structure shrouded in canvas. Thus bedecked, the airplane leaves the experimental factory Monday morning, October 5th, and starts its long trek to the next scene of operations, several hundred road miles to the north of San Diego. The men who turned in the fine job on this airplane will now work toward repeating their performance on the second prototype, scheduled for flight this coming December. Appropriately, the first movement of the 102 is across the airport at San Diego, but this time at a snail's pace and hardly recognizable as the mightiest interceptor yet built. As the airplane enters city traffic, the careful planning behind the move becomes apparent. Even with the wingtips removed, the package took sufficient road space so that expert handling and control were necessary to avoid obstacles and to cope with normal traffic. The route had been carefully surveyed well ahead of time and all contingencies anticipated. On only one occasion was it necessary to remove a highway sign to let the airplane pass. The strange group with the large, weird-shaped object on the truck aroused much curiosity in the course of their journey. This chap exemplifies the average reaction. The airplane passed from the coastal regions over the mountains to the desert areas. The total trip took two days with an overnight stop at March Air Force Base. The convoy arrived at Edwards late in the afternoon of October 6th to complete the slowest cross-country trip this airplane will ever experience. With arrival at Edwards Air Force Base, the airplane is unloaded from the truck and the wrappings removed. Everything is in fine shape and in readiness for the experimental crew to take over. All those items taken off of the airplane at San Diego for the move now must be reinstalled. The ejection seat is lowered into place, the nose cone mounted, and the fin and wing tips returned to their proper locations. The pilot's canopy is installed and given a close check for smooth operation. Here's the engine installation. Although the engine and airplane meet here for the first time, all control, plumbing, and wiring installations are intact and accurate in the airplane, thanks to a neat trick at San Diego of utilizing the second prototype for fitting while work progressed on this airplane. Now comes the time for the airplane to leave the hangar and to go out to more active phases of pre-flight operations. As the airplane emerges, it is possible to study some of its more characteristic features. The long nose boom is covered with a guard to protect the delicate pitch and yaw vanes mounted thereon. The pointed nose of the F-102 now houses instrumentation for the flight test work, but this space is reserved for the electronic guidance in the tactical articles. Note the 60-degree delta plan form, the cheek-located air ducts, and the completely submerged missile bay. Also note the three symmetrically located dive brakes. The airplane gets its first fueling prior to checking the fuel system and running the engines. Fueling and defueling are conducted at one connection in the wheel well for ease of service. All fuel for a normal intercept mission is carried internally in the wings in pressurized tanks. With a desire to fly at the earliest possible date, work goes on around the clock with a level of morale on the part of the workers at an all-time high. In an airplane as advanced as the F-102, many components must be checked and rechecked, adjusted and fitted so that the test pilot need worry about nothing but his own job of flying the new craft. All the months of high pitch activity are approaching a climax and everything must be done absolutely right before the airplane is allowed to be released for flight. With workmanship as close to perfection as possible in mind, the men work through the night in the light of floodlights and into the dawn of the following day, day after day. It is this type of diligence on the part of American workmen that help make possible the weapons the Air Force needs.
The first engine runs are highly satisfactory. This engine was first assigned to Convair as a test stand engine and was later released for flight use on the basis of other tests being conducted at Pratt & Whitney's factory. The engine installed in this airplane is the Pratt & Whitney J57P11 of 14,800 pounds thrust. This engine will be replaced by J57 engines of later series and higher thrusts and eventually by either the Wright J67 or the Pratt & Whitney J75, both of which are very high thrust engines. The airplane is supersonic with any of these power plants and will develop its desired performance with the J-67 or the J-75. With all systems checked, the airplane is returned to the hangar for inspection by Convair personnel and by a team of Air Force safety inspectors. One of the first operations is a check on weight and center of gravity. The airplane is placed on scales and measurements taken. The control surfaces are inspected. The elevons move coincidentally for pitch and differentially for roll. The cockpit is also inspected. As mentioned earlier, the nose of the airplane is allocated to radar and to electronic fire control installations, but for the flight test phase of the F-102, this space is devoted to complete instrumentation, including recording and telemetering equipment. Inspection complete, the time has come to let the airplane show off some of its capabilities. So the F-102 comes out of the hangar for its first trip to the airport and taxi trials. Taxi runs are to be made on the long north-south runway on the lake bed to give the pilot plenty of room to feel out his new aircraft. Chosen as pilot for the first trials and flight of the F-102 was Richard L. Johnson, who recently joined Convair, San Diego, as chief engineering test pilot for Air Force airplanes. Dick, until recently, was with the Air Force, and as a lieutenant colonel, was chief of the fighter branch at Wright Air Development Center, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. With 4,500 hours flight time, with more than 1,400 of these hours in jet aircraft, and with his extensive background in military aviation, Dick is highly qualified for this job of testing the F-102. He has flown most types of operational fighter aircraft and has flown most of the American, British, and French experimental types, including many of the British Deltas. Teamed with Dick in this test program is Sam Shannon, Chief of Experimental Flight Testing at San Diego. Sam was the first man in the world to fly a Delta Wing airplane, starting with the XF-92A in 1948 and continuing more recently with Convair's Navy XF-2Y1 Sea Dart. The convoy of radio-equipped cars and cars bearing the pilot and test crews leave the pavement at Edwards and proceed down the lake bed to the far south end from where the taxi trials will start. Although all available space is desired for early trials, the F-102 has been designed to operate from any average length municipal airport. With the plane at the head of the runway, last minute activity gets underway. Dick Johnson is preparing to climb aboard and all is in readiness for the taxi runs. After last minute talks with flight test personnel and Air Force officers, Dick climbs the ladder to enter the plane. Checks complete, the engines are started and further checking of power plant operation takes place. When everything has worked out to his satisfaction, Dick closes the canopy and prepares for the runs to follow. Let's watch the low-speed taxi runs. Now let's watch the high-speed taxi run. In the course of this operation, the airplane was held on the ground until it reached 190 miles per hour, which proved to slightly exceed the design criteria for the tires. Result, 
both main tires blew. The ship swerved slightly, but as you will see here, completely under the pilot's control at all times. Tire one, tire two. This is what happens to an overworked tire with no piece big enough remaining to allow examination. The tire manufacturer's representative came out to get the serial numbers, but decided upon inspection that he could do without them. Less than 24 hours after the tires blew, the airplane was back on the lake. On the afternoon of Friday, October 23rd, the airplane made another high-speed taxi run and liftoff, allowing Johnson to get the feel of the controls. On the morning of Saturday, October 24th, the plane was again at the head of the runway. Johnson has a last word with Phil Prophet of the flight test department. He lowers the canopy and he is ready to take the airplane for its first full-fledged flight. With power and starting gear hooked up to the airplane, the engines are started. Along the runway, observers take their places and get set to record the takeoff. A wind reading is made, a last minute visual check, mobile radio calls the control center, and the cameramen make ready. An observer in one of the chase planes sees the F-102 turn, go to the extreme end of the runway, and head into the wind. Let's watch as the airplane becomes airborne for the first flight at 10.24 hours on October 24th. As can be observed, the landing gear would not lock in the up position. Because of this, Dick had to forego his established flight plan, and at the end of a 16-minute flight, he decided to land. Of interest is the complete assortment of aircraft, straight, swept, and delta wings in the chase group. Dick's observations were that the airplane responded properly to the controls and was sweet to handle. As we can see, the stability of the airplane is highly apparent. Now let's watch the first approach and landing. Note the typical high angle of attack.
After a reasonable roll, Dick turns the airplane about and heads back to the takeoff point. On this, the first flight of the 102, the airplane was airborne in less than 5,000 feet and landing distance well within reason. It is apparent to all here that a check on the gear is called for and another flight be made. As Dick comes out of the airplane, he is met by Sandy Kogan, San Diego Convair Division Manager who, like all others witnessing this flight, was anxious to hear Dick's own account of his experience. After a check of the landing gear uplatch mechanism that indicated satisfactory operation, a second flight is made the same day. with the gear is still with us, so Dick decides to cut short the flight. The plan is for Dick to take the airplane to high subsonic speeds on the first flight with gear locked up and to go full level flight speed on the second flight. the second landing of the day, very similar to the first, with its typical high angle of attack and sound appearance of stability. Flying chase on these first flights were Major Yeager in an F-86, Major Slade Nash and an Air Force photographer in a T-33, and a Convair pilot and Convair cameraman in another T-33. General Holtener, commander of Edwards Air Force Base, also flew chase on the first flight in an F-80. As the F-102 taxis back to the waiting crew, winding up its first day of flight testing, we feel proud of this day's achievement and feel that the Air Force also has a full right to pride on their own behalf in their new supersonic weapon. The flights made here today open a new chapter in the development of this interceptor toward the day when these aircraft become an active part of Air Defense Command. Saturday, December 12, 1959. The man in the cockpit is Major Joseph W. Rogers, 35, resident of Colorado Springs, Colorado. Father of three children, veteran of 170 combat missions in Korea, and holder of 17 decorations. His airplane is an F-106, built in San Diego by the Convair people, and by people in 180 other cities across the nation, who make things like the Pratt & Whitney J-75 engine from Hartford, and the Hughes Falcon missile from Culver City, California. Have a look. For if this land were set upon tonight by a force of enemy bombers, this man and his machine and others like him would in that final moment when defender meets attacker be the main rampart between this country and kingdom come.
This is how wide the wall, how high the wall, how sharp the lance. The aircraft that blew us into World War II in December 1941 approached their target from an altitude of 9,000 feet on a relatively clear day at about 250 miles per hour. It was high enough and fast enough. Nothing stopped them. If there were a manned bomber attack today, it would come at perhaps 60,000 feet and faster than sound. But this time, something would have to stop them. Getting something up there in time is the responsibility of the North American Air Defense Command, headquartered at Colorado Springs, Colorado. There are 200,000 people in NORAD. Army, Navy, Air Force, Canadian and American, civilian and military. NORAD has a defending force of approximately 60 squadrons of combat aircraft, a good percentage of which are stationed on the alert, the clock and the year around, at bases in the United States, Canada and Greenland. The man in charge at NORAD is General Lawrence Cuter. This is where General Cuter keeps track of what is going on, on a map of the North American continent about the size of a golf green, where every unidentified airborne aircraft in the entire area covered by the map is plotted within a maximum of five minutes after it is picked up by radar. If the unknowns fail to identify themselves, there is a split-second scramble of Cuter's men to see what's wrong. Easy? No. Any man in uniform will tell you it is the toughest military assignment in the nation. The enemy gets the first move. His equipment is good. He can come in fast, high or low, from north, east or west, good weather or thick. Against these enormous advantages, Cuter must bank on the effectiveness of the radar warning system and on interceptor aircraft that can get off the ground in seconds, climb to 40,000 feet in the time it takes to drive through the Holland Tunnel, find the invader with electronic eyes 10,000 times more efficient than human eyes, and close on him at speeds nearly five times faster than fighter planes of World War II. What are NORAD's chances? It may be that time will tell. For time has become NORAD's element almost as much as air. Warning time and reaction time. The unceasing battle at NORAD is to build one up and cut the other down. A city could be saved with five minutes more warning time. 50,000 lives might be spared if NORAD's defending aircraft could get into firing position in 30 seconds less reaction time. Time is the essence at NORAD. Cuter and his men work with it, for it, and against it, never stopping. On Saturday, December 12th, Major Rogers and his F-106A are working against it, 40,000 feet above the Mojave Desert in California. A clear, cold day good flying weather. And so Major Rogers is out chipping away at reaction time, trying actually to set a new world speed record to improve the official mark of 1,404 miles per hour held by the United States, and if humanly possible, to smash the unofficial record of 1,483 miles per hour claimed by Russia. The rules for setting a new world speed record are established by Fédération Aéronautique Internationale, a worldwide organization headquartered in Paris and represented in the United States by the National Aeronautic Association. They are not easy rules. In the first place, the old mark has to be bettered by at least 1%. In the second place, the prescribed course is actually an electronic tube 10 miles long, 2 miles wide, and 328 feet deep. Stick a wingtip out of the tube and you're through. It's almost like threading a whole row of needles with one fast sweep of the hand. You don't steer the plane, you aim it. Then after you've done it once, you have to do it again, 
going the opposite way so that your two times can be averaged after the flight to neutralize any favorable winds one way or the other. And just to be sure there are no inaccuracies, the NAA sends a team of 16 men with barographs, motion picture equipment and stopwatches to supervise. The fight against time in the air is a fight against many things. Q limits, Mach limits, and TT2 limits, for example. The Q limit is how fast an airplane can go without the risk of air pressure crumpling the nose and leading edges of the wings. The TT2 limit is the temperature ceiling for the air feeding into the engine. Let it get too high, and the engines may overspeed or even break up. The Mach limit is the speed beyond which heat and air pressure may cause the aircraft to become uncontrollable. December 12th. This is Major Rogers' seventh attempt. Surely the limits are full in his mind. But so are the rewards. Achieving a few seconds less reaction time. Adding a little to America's deterrent strength. For a new world speed record is the herald of an improved defense capability. A fact any would-be aggressor will remember. And there's also the technical reward. For a flight like this can produce as much technical information about the behavior of aircraft at high speeds as six precious months of normal research. It's worth pushing the limits. This is Roger's approach to the tube. This is his run. But this is not the day either. The plane dropped a few feet beneath the boundary of the skin-tight course and was disqualified. And so the homework starts all over again for both the man and his airplane. There's welcome help from men like Colonel Tom Queen, Air Defense Command Project Officer. Chuck Myers, Convair Chief Test Pilot. And Dick Johnson, another Convair Test Pilot and holder of the world speed record once himself. And there's more watching for a good day. And more waiting. Then on Tuesday, December 15th, another airplane comes in for the try, number 467 a run of the production line 106, which checks in for the occasion at full combat weight of about 34,000 pounds. Earlier, it was given a quick road test by Convair test pilot James Stewart and found to be ready and eager. Weather check again. The day is clear and bright. The weather station reports temperatures at 40,500 feet, Roger's chosen altitude, at minus 65 degrees centigrade, eight degrees colder than the ideal. Up again to the gauntlet of the waiting invisible tube. In his pocket, there's a Tom Sawyer collection of rabbit's feet, good luck pieces, charms, and coins. The offering of his well-wishers before takeoff. This is the approach. This is the run. This is the timer's voice counting the miles. We're looking real good in uh, five miles to the first camera station. Three miles. Two miles. One mile. Half. Mark first station. Mach 2.2. Mach 2.3.
cool indeed, Major Rogers. The date, December 15th, 1959. The place, Edwards Air Force Base, California. The pilot, Major Joseph W. Rogers of the Air Defense Command. The plane, a Convair F-106A. The time, 1,525 miles per hour. A new world's record, an improvement of 120 miles an hour over the previous official record. Tonight, the moat is a little wider, the wall a little higher, the lance a little sharper. <laughs> 